The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, IRS Limited, ABN 47060313359, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to Advice 2030, where we explore the future of financial advice. I'm Peter Diamantidis, and in this series, we're diving into the seven megatrends identified in a joint report by Deloitte and Iris. But before we look to the future, we're starting with how advisors are already using technology to boost efficiency and create great client experiences right now. Throughout the series, we'll also hear from Iris leadership about how they're turning insights from the report into action and what's coming up next on the product roadmap. So let's get started. Could your business take on 30 more clients? Through X-Plan, IRS is on a mission to help advice businesses boost efficiency and free up capacity. The goal? To help our industry get ready for the $2.1 billion advice opportunity revealed in the Big Shift research and to help bring more advice to more Australians. X-Plan, unmatched in advice technology. Okay, so Iris, together with Deloitte Access Economics, has recently released the report, Advice 2023, The Big Shift, uh, which walks us through seven megatrends set to usher in a new era. Well, I'd call it opportunity of advice. Now, here with me today to dive into the report are Dean Sanders and John Omani from Deloitte. Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. You are very welcome. I'm a bit excited about this. Now, There is so much to this report. This is not a one or two pager. It's quite a bit longer than that. And there's a lot of detail, which we'll dive into. However, I want to give the audience uh, a better understanding and just sort of position it for them. Uh, It's fair to say that sort of looking back into what we've all experienced in the last decade or so, or even longer in the financial advice industry, it's been very much focused on the how we do things, right? And that's been due to regulatory change, legislative, all sorts of other things, maybe a bit of technology. It's really got us to think about how we do things and efficiency and things like that. Whereas for me, the report felt like it was really proposing that as we look forward, it's going to be a lot about what we provide advice on, you know, almost shifting the very nature of financial advice. Dean, now I realize that's a very simplistic take on it. It's going to be far more complicated than that, I know. But is that a fair characterization of the report, do you think? Look, I think there's a great deal in there that's about the what. You're right, Peter. I'm going to throw something on the table. I know we'll dig into the what as part of our conversation. Yeah. But I'm also going to throw in there that I also think it's about the why. Right. And one of the most significant things that we understood as the research was underway is that when you begin to step back from the daily fray of financial advice, the endless struggle that is facing into regulation and market change and industry changes, that there is something going on that is much larger about the way society is shifting around our yeah. relationship with advice or our relationship with the financial future. Yeah. And that's what we began to unravel was the fact that there's a, the, these megatrends as we identified them. is a, mm. It's a story, if you like, of how these are just individual trends in isolation. These are things that accumulate to something quite profound yeah. about that big shift. Yeah. So, John, would you, is that your take too? Is it, 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 there's still a bit of how in in the way we need to respond to what we're going to see in the future? Or is is it predominantly the what that we're going to have to consider or the why? Well, I think um, we sat down with Iris, uh, Deloitte Access Economics team at the beginning of the project, and we really wanted to change the nature of the conversation. Um, We know the industry conversation has been dominated in recent years about regulatory change, cost impost on the sector. And while they're important conversations to have, um, looking to the future, we wanted to understand, well, what are the big societal mega trends Mm -hmm. that'll affect the sector? Um, And also to empower financial advisors. Um, This isn't just regulation or costs happening to them, but with the right choices, how do they succeed into the future? So um, that shift from just a regulatory focus to a financial advisor focus is something that we hope comes through in in the big shift in this in this research report. And I think the the word megatrends important here to just latch onto for a second because 
I know, Dean, and, Dean, you and I in a conversation previously have sort of said, look, regulatory change has felt, I mean, just all encompassing, uh, constant, you know, battering for us as advisors. But, you know, perhaps that's going to, we're going to look back and go, that was a tidal wave. What we're facing now is more like a tsunami in terms of the possible change. You know, is that really how big a difference you see this as what's coming is just enormous compared to potentially what we've managed to change and adjust with so far? Well, gee, it sounds terrifying when you frame it that know. way, but but it, but it is. I think the difference is that, and this is going to sound like an odd way of presenting it, but I think the difference is that tidal waves will wipe you out, and they are constant, as we say. That the regulatory change, um, industry change, market change has been just so permanent yeah. that people have become inured to that change, right. not comfortable with it, just permanently in battle with it. Yeah. A tidal wave or a tsunami in the, in, the, in the context here will lift all the markets, will yeah. change all of the markets. That's what I think is significant about this. We're not just talking about shifts to financial advice. We're talking about the fact that there are shifts going on on a large scale outside the sector from which financial advice can benefit yeah. if, if advisors position themselves the right way. Yeah, so it lifts everybody. Absolutely. Or swamp everybody. They're, they're this is not about drowning for me. This is about learning to surf. You know, this yeah. is this is really sad. And doesn't doesn't surfing a tsunami sound so much more exciting? It does, horrifying, but also yeah, exactly more exciting. Um, so I think it'd be worth just talking about the methodology you've applied and the work that's been done here. Um, for those of you that haven't seen the report, that are listening, you know, there's some seventy reference materials there. You can go into the back of the report and look at, through them all. This is clearly a very deep and thoughtful piece of work, John. Talk us through initially. So, who were the key collab- collaborators and stakeholders uh, in the creation of the report? Where did you start? How did you pull this together? What What we aspire for this this report is to build on what has been done, rather than just try to replicate it um, or have it done without regard to lots of good research that's been done over the years. So, so as you said, just being understanding the current snapshot of the sector, um, putting together, I think it's, yeah, as you said, 70 different sources of industry um, data. It's public um, sources. It's private sources. Um, it's also a bespoke survey data collection across 250 financial advisors as a sample um, across Australia, just to to get a sense of what the day-to-day experience is like for financial advisors and also um, their attitudes towards the future. And then speaking to a number of advisors um, in a longer form session, just to understand what some of the responses have been. Um, so it's getting all the different um, pieces of the puzzle together and then trying to distill it down into a vision of the future. So we've, we've managed to boil it down, Peter, into seven key megatrends that'll f- affect um, financial advisors and try to map these map these trends against, against two key questions, which is how will they affect the complexity of financial advice? How will they affect the personalization of the services that are offered at, w- with an eye to what are the sorts of fees, what's the business opportunity for financial advisors. So it's not just talking about broader societal change, but then it's trying to boil it down, Peter, into those 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 those, those key questions of what's the implications for a financial advisor business. And then, of course, we segue to what, what, what they can do about it. So Yeah, so that's interesting. So there's the work that's already been done or the analysis that's already done. You've used that as almost the starting point. So, okay, we've got that where do we go beyond that? What's next? What's possible? I'm curious, Dean, in terms of the data from the advice practices and the interactions that you, you've you witnessed, were there any really surprising things that came out of that just initially? You thought, oh, that wasn't an answer I expected. Was there anything that just stood out as part of that that data collection process from the advice practices? Oh, look, I have to say there was there were some quite surprises all the way through the project, really. It was um, pleasant in most instances and surprising. Yeah. I want to just respond briefly to the point that John made there because I know that for many of the listeners, they're used to seeing reports. They're used to seeing every single day in multiple industry media platforms, somebody offering an opinion about the future and about the challenge. We recognize that's regular email fodder. Yeah. We wanted to make sure we're doing something different here. One, by bringing the strength of access economics to that conversation really, really powerfully about the way we think about data and evidence. But yeah. but secondly, making sure to John's point about how that's framed into action, not just another story of horror or challenge or change, but framed in terms of opportunity. And that's what was surprising to us in our conversations with the advisors is frankly how up for it they were. Yeah. And I know it's easy for me in my particular history with the sector to 
to, to recognize that, that change is always coming and the people are often worn down by the scale of that change. So it was really positive. It was really exciting to see advisors saying, no, we're ready now. We've built our businesses. We're feeling strong. We're feeling resilient. We are ready to take advantage of these changes. I was frankly deeply impressed by that, which came through in a large proportion mm. of the advisors we spoke to. Because it's muscle, I've, I've, isn't it? You've got to develop that muscle, I think. Yeah, I've got, I've got two for you. Peter, on the surprise funds, one's a quantitative one, um, one's a, a, a an anecdote. Um, the first one, just on the on the on the number side of things, is how robust the current sector is. Surprised us because we've all heard the story of the the collapse in the number of advisors over the last five years. It's it's halved. Australia has fifteen thousand um, uh, uh, registered um, financial advisors. But what we've looked at as well in this report is the the returns, the profit rates of the businesses who survive. Right. And we found that that's already turned around. Profit rates are back to what they were like before the the, uh, the Hain Royal Commission. So there's a level of robustness, resilience there in the sector that can be a platform for this change. And we, yeah, we think yeah. the industry's up for it. So that was one thing that, that surprised us. The second one is the challenges that financial advisors are facing just with the volume of inquiries and potential demand. Yeah. That It's not that there's a lack of need in the community or a lack of interest in this. Um, most of the time when you hear of an industry that's struggling, it's because the demand side isn't there. Yeah. This is totally different for financial advisors. The phone calls are coming in. The emails are coming in. The question is, how do I as a business manage that change? And that's what the big shift is all about. I was ch chatting to a marketing expert and they said what they're seeing is um, it's no longer about lead generation. It's about no. lead, lead qualification yes. because there's too many leads. What do we do with them all? How do we yeah. handle it? So, And what a shift. Yes. Right? That in itself is so significant. Now you, we've we've got these seven mega trends. I'm just a little curious. Was there like 400 of them to begin with? How did you narrow that down? Because there must have been a lot to consider or potential ones to include in the report. You know what got in versus what got out of the report. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there was a it's a it's a qualification process of looking at all the different societal trends and then trying to prioritise those that have the biggest direct impact on financial advisors. That is either your questions earlier, Peter. What was advised? How was it, how how was advised? Um, the big exclusion um, from this research is trying not to focus so much on potential regulatory change. So we know that there's a um, a, 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 a um, bill that's been introduced into the parliament down in Canberra for potential further changes that will affect the uh, affect the industry. That's going to happen every year, Peter. Yes. There's going to be ongoing regulatory change. It's difficult to predict. Yes, it will affect. Um, yes, it will affect costs. But what we wanted to focus on in the big shift is what financial advisors can do, rather than just you know staring into the staring into into the regulatory into the regulatory map. So that's why that's probably the big part of this research report. That's in other research. That's not as much of a focus here. And I think it's actually a bit exciting because I've got to say, it's um, when you look at regulatory change and responding to it. It's it's not particularly inspiring, to be fair, whereas I think there's real opportunity for creativity in response to these trends. Like the ones you guys have laid out, there's, I, th I think there's some practices out there that, out there that will take these and run with them. You well, know? I, think, I think by definition, regulation is always reacting to something. Yeah. Um, governments, and we'll often speak to this fact, that, that, that they're never in front of a problem. That's the nature of government. Government is always reacting to some alleged threat or alleged risk or some sort of challenge. Yeah. This is absolutely, to John's point, about stepping in front of that and saying, now, where are the actual things going on in the societal systems, in the market systems, in the wider economic system that advisors can take advantage of? When you take that position, when you take the position to lean forward, mm -hmm. then regulation will catch up with you. Re regulation chases you rather than you spending your entire time facing into regulation. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's important because it's a changing of the relationship even between the sector and regulation. Yeah. Rather than sitting back and waiting for things to be done to it, this is about taking charge of our own futures. It is. And I think anybody listening would feel like at some point in the last decade or so, we've all felt like a victim in part. You know, it's felt like it's happening to us. I think for us to be able to happen to something else, I think is exciting um, and more motivating, like you say. Uh, so, you know, we are going to dive into each of the seven mega trends. Um, but to give the listener a bit of a framework um, to really consider each of these, I'd love, uh, Dean, for you to talk through the sort of choices, the four choices you've identified that the practice can make to embrace these, uh, you know, megatrends head on. You know, can you talk us through each of those? 
But we really did want to make sure we dedicated a great deal of time to thinking about, so with all of this new information, what can I do as an advisor? Yeah. You know, what, what choices do what, I have? Yeah, that, yeah. And, and really encouraging that sort of agency, really encouraging that sort of self, that, that power. Now, the four choices that we identified, we wanted to make sure we we're talking in language that matters to the advice sector too. Right. So it wasn't about introducing new language or new complexity. There was about saying so that your listeners will be familiar with the, the choices as an idea. And the choices are between how do we work with customers, i.e. who do we want to work with? Right. You know, what type of customer? Who is the right customer for us, for our business? Then there's questions about business model. Now, that used to be a pretty straight line transaction, you know? Yeah. Who do I work for in yeah. the wise and see model? Well, business models can be radically disrupted in the future of advice. And that's about thinking, what's the type, right type of business model for me? Is it full-scale service? Is it technology-driven? Is it partnership modeling? How do these things all sit together? What's the relationship? So business choices are a part of that. Specialization, of course. What advice do I want to work in? What's the area do I want to work in? Because that's increasingly complex too. So specialization is one of those channels. This goes to professionalization. It goes to education requirements. It goes to the people you partner with. It goes to a whole raft of those types of things. And of course, lastly, and nobody gets out of this conversation without this one coming up is technology. Yeah. You know, what sort of technology choices do I make for my practice? Including, by the way, the way I relate to consumers, um, the sort of solution sets that I might be providing in supporting my business. So technology is clearly a choice. So we, we put those choices on a spectrum. Right. And, and allowed advisors, and you can see this in the report, to make choices about, so where do I think fits for me? Mm. And map for themselves the future in the context of that. Knowing these big shift and these disruptions, these mega trends, and giving these choices, what does my future business look like? So it's a planning tool in that regard. Mm. And, and, it, oops, yeah, okay. and, and there's a big opportunity um, for the advisor businesses that are able to make those choices and embrace change. We put on the table, Peter, a few big numbers yep. in this report. It wouldn't be a Deloitte <laughs> Access Economic no, Report without it. <laughs> um, but, but, but even even in a sector where we're not expecting huge growth in the number of financial advisors in the next four or five years, we are expecting a big growth in revenue for the sector um, because of the growth in customers. So, I mean, a lot of people who are on who are listening to this podcast will know about. The, the ocean of need, unmet need for financial advice, that's been put at 11.8 million um, Australians. We've got a, a, con a more conservative number in this research report of an extra 500,000 people being served over the next four or five years. But, but to put that in dollar terms, that's an extra, an extra $2.1 billion in potential revenue for financial advisors who are listening to this podcast. Yeah. That's a huge amount of revenue. But what it will require is, as Dean said, is making choices. Well, which ones am I going to serve? Am I going to try to serve a lot more people with yeah, with a streamlined advice service that's that's technology enabled? Or am I going to focus on, you know, a few um uh, uh, larger clients, you know, around estate planning or other things that might have higher returns. So um uh, in the modeling that we've done in the report, we try to help um, financial advisors think their way through those choices by saying, well, how complex is the advice? You know, what's the fee opportunity? So that they can see that revenue and and think, well, how can I change my business to get to get to get access to that? So we think there really is a, a bright future um, for financial for financial advice. That's regulated financial advice over the next four or five years. We also point out in the research report, um, Peter, that um, if financial advisors aren't providing it, well, people are going to get their information. We might call it from somewhere else. And yeah. there, there's a few, there's a few, there's a few dodgy places um, that people shouldn't be relying on on for, for their financial advice. Look, I think that's the that's the really compelling part of thinking this through, Peter. Is that we, as a sector, have always had client demand. To your point, the whether it's lead generation versus lead qualification is one of those examples of that shift. But when you have eleven point three million dollars at a con sorry Australians at a conservative number being still unmet, unserved yeah. in their financial advice needs, you can't sit here and say the competition will ignore that. <laughs> no, somebody will fill that void. That's right. <laughs> now the, the industry will grow at the rate it chooses to grow, and it will embrace change at the rate it chooses to embrace change. If it doesn't, though, then those eleven point three million and the existing will will absolutely be right fodder for any change in competition. It's important to think about the fact that, that we really wanted to focus on those things that are external to the market. If we characterize it, the change that's coming, as we said at the top of the podcast, 
was historically that's been happening within the sector. Yeah. The regulation applying within the sector, business models changing within the sector, service models changing within the sector. Well, this is stuff happening outside, coming at it, fintech, AI issues, policy changes in superannuation, you know, market shifts, cryptocurrencies. These are things, social changes in terms of what consumers need and want yeah. from their advice relationships. These are all happening from outside in, and yeah. somebody will take advantage of that um, unless this sector chooses to. And it, it is an important mindset shift because we have been so inward looking that I think that can become dangerous if that's the only way we look going forward. Um, and it's interesting, out of the four choices, to me, starting with the customer, like the choices you make about who you serve mm-hmm. and, and what they need, that's got to be the starting point really for anything because all of the others are going to lead from that. You know, all the It was always the holy grail, wasn't it? Right? It was always the holy grail. And I think it, um, an important part of that, because even in this sort of way of thinking about it, we wanted to dig deeper mm-hmm. than just the normal sort of client segmentation style strategies. So this is not about demographics. It's not about saying, I want, I want a young audience of clients or I want an older or, or the holy, the white, the great white whale of the high net worth yep. you know, client, recognizing, as John will speak to, the shift in what that means in terms of percentage of population. But this is about saying, now, who do I choose to work with? Mm. Recognizing that even in the client construct, that's changing. Well, all of us live with, and I'm sure many of the listeners live with the fact that we are of a particular generation where our entire familial structures are changing. Yes. The way families work are changing. We have elderly parents we're responsible for. We have young children we're responsible for who aren't leaving home at either end of the scale. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so the financial decisions around that kitchen table have radically changed. Yeah. Who's in charge of what decision <laughs> has radically changed. Yeah. So the, these require whole different skills. Now, I know many advisors are familiar with that tension, but it's but the great tidal wave of retirement income shifts, any of the generational wealth transfer, I mean, this is suddenly going to get very real yeah. and very expensive. Yeah. And, and it's, it's one of the things that the um, that the IRIS uh, CEO, uh, Marcus Price, got, set us as an aspiration at the beginning of this project was to unpick how rising prosperity in this country will be driving more financial advice needs over the next few years. I mean, just by one metric, you could think of sophisticated investors. Um, uh, a couple of decades ago, Peter, that was 1.5% of the population. It's over 10% now. It's going to be 20% in another 10 years' time. That is the number of folks who've got at least $2.5 million in assets. Around those kitchen tables that, that Dean's talking about there, there's simply more money and more wealth that requires advice compared with 10, 20 years ago. That's only going to grow. So it's not just the the society changes that are disrupting the sector. There's simply going to be more wealth that needs advice on. So it's a really big driver of change as well. And, you know, the kitchen tables themselves are looking different. To Dean's point, you know, there's far more people remaining single for longer. Yes. You know, where do they live? How do they live? Like all these things are massive shifts that, to be frank, I think for most of the Australian public, we sort of can't believe that the that the government hasn't been more onto this. Mm. I mean, the rental crisis, all these things, we're all sort of going, well, it feels like that was going to happen anyway. Like it feels like, you guys, you weren't onto this. And so as an industry, we need to be onto it too. You know, there's probably some conversations that maybe we never would have been part of and property is one and, and where and how people live that, you know, down the track, maybe we need to be, you know, maybe we need to be part of these sort of demographic conversations or the way it's changing for the Australian park, you know, public as we go forward. And that's one potential additional audience for for the big shift for the research report. That is the policy folks in Canberra as well. While the primary audience is the financial advisors who are listening to this podcast, um, uh, the broader policy audience, because what the report also talks about is how financial advice isn't just good for the clients um, or even for the financial advisor businesses, but it's critical for Australia's economic future and it's important for society as well. I mean, some of the numbers in the in the in the report, Peter, Australia would have an extra two point one trillion dollars, not billion, trillion dollars in savings over the next three decades if people are advised properly, if they've got the returns that they're entitled to. Um, it would also mean a thirteen percent reduction in the call on the age pension cost that's rising over time. It's something that is that is that is that is stressing the minds of policy folks in Canberra. So um, while this is mostly about what financial advisors do, there's an important secondary audience, that policy audience, um, to make sure we have accessible and quality advice in the future. Look, it's, it's, it's always been my strong view that financial advice is an honourable profession that plays a 
profoundly important role in the lives of individuals and the nation. Yeah. And so shifting that conversation to how it is contributing to that is really vital. We've, we've, we've been so busy trying to justify our existence yeah. as a sector in response to, the, to impending regulation that has not been understood as its contribution. And this is why framing them around megatrends, facing directly into the large shifts that are going on, including things like affordability of housing, mm-hmm. one of the things we'll talk about when we get to the megatrends, mm-hmm. these, are, these are really important conversations. I'd actually even suggest that there are many, that, that, that the policy community is not even just a secondary audience. They are absolutely a parallel audience to this because how we feed into that and think about the future of the nation, the $2.1 trillion is national benefit. Right. Not industry benefit. That's, yeah. that, that's, a, that's how we contribute, how this community contributes to the future of the nation. Yeah. A deeply important conversation. Absolutely. So for the listeners, you know, whether you're an advisor or you're working in advice practice, then as we go through each of the megatrends, which we will now do, really keep those choices in mind. Just be, you know, framing each of those and thinking, well, what do we do in our practice? What would this mean? Because as the gentleman is saying, this is about action. This is not... Uh, just pontification. We're all going to sit here and and chat about it. This is a thought provoking exercise. This is and in in part, I've got to say, my experience of reading through the report and thinking through it, it's been it. Some of it's a bit painful in that. Oh, how do we do that? Like this is hard. This is not. There's not answers. There's not easy solutions. This is thought provoking. You know, get you to think through what can we do and how might we shift things, which means anytime there's that shift, there's opportunities. So as we go through these, make sure you keep that in mind. So let's dive in then. And let's start with one we're probably all familiar with, but I think it's a good starting base, which is this skyrocketing retirement demand. So Dean, there is a significant demographic shift that we're all aware of. It really sets the stage for even further increasing need for retirement advice. Talk us through that in the terms of the report. Look, I think that you're right, Peter, that everybody's familiar with that idea, you know, that there's a, an increasing need for advice in retirement. But I think that it's an example of you were framing before, that this is no surprise to the policy system. <laughs> People age. Funnily you know, enough. Surprise, yeah. surprise. <laughs> um, we, have, we have, as we all know, a retirement income system, or more importantly, a superannuation system built fundamentally on principles of accumulation with panic about what happens when we move to the stage of, <laughs> of spending. We haven't got to, we are literally on that frame now. Government's asking itself questions. Advice a bit at the forefront of this conversation, helping clients make good choices about pension phase existence and what that means for them. So it's one thing to say that it's skyrocketing, but it's a whole other thing to be, when you begin to think about the numbers, which we understood, it's not just a, it's not just a number that 20% of people are aging or there'll be more than that in the, work, in the, in the retirement phase lifestyle. It's the fact that by, within the generation of listeners of this podcast, there may well be more non-tax generating participants in the retirement marketplace than there are in the advised marketplace in pre-pension. Yeah. So the, that's a radical shift in the nature of the marketplace. It's not just a, sh- a sudden shift of people wanting to spend money, but also what does spending money mean for the way we think about lifestyle? Yeah. I mean, we, we're having conversations about inflation right now. What happens when the more people are spending money than earning it? In the context of different, uh, we're not here to talk about macro, and I must leave that to my economic expert. <laughs> but we, are, but just as an example of yeah. why this is a different conversation than just an increasing demand for retirement income advice. Yeah. This has profound social shifts as well. Yeah, and it's going to it's going to broaden as well, um, Peter, away from not just the traditional sources of income and tax advice, but also thinking about other life stages, segueing into a conversation about uh, uh, aged care facilities. Um, age pension, bequests, and how the whole family will be part of this conversation as well. So it's an area that our financial advisors are very familiar with. In our research, we found it's the most common type of financial advice that's provided. Over half of financial advisors provide um, retirement planning advice of some sort. So um, this one should be one of the easier ones for, for, for our listeners today to potentially take the next step on. It'll be about growth, but it'll also be about the change in, in, in what's being advised on as well. And I think it's in like it's interesting from a number of facets. I mean, one of the things we've seen in our practice is cash flow advice has always been something we've talked about for young people, right? And it's like, well, they can't get investment advice, they don't have money to invest. Let's help them get some, let's give them a cash flow advice. I'm seeing a lot more of that necessary in retirees. So they just I mean, in the old days, and I'm I'm showing my age here a bit, but with um defined benefit schemes and things like that in retirement where people just got a certain income and off they went and it continued forever, well, 
they didn't have to make so many decisions about what they did with their money or how they spent it necessarily. Whereas now there is so much flexibility there, then helping people take care or even maybe spend more of their money, maybe not holding back as much mm, yeah. with what they're spending. There's a lot more to this than just setting up the allocated pension and off you go. Right. In fact, I think even Peter, what what you know, one of the things to hypothesize about for that sector, that for that particular trend, of course, is that we have a different relationship with spending as people are now moving into pension phase. Right. Famously, people are familiar with the fact that for most of our generation of people who are already in retirement phase, they are underspending yes. egregiously because they have fear of losing, fear of running out. That, but that's a particular product of a generation that were ra- largely frugal. Yes. Anyway, well, I think it's reasonable to share with the people on this podcast is we're not so frugal right. <laughs> We all like to live. Got out of that habit. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and um, and so the consequence of that in a different phase of pension is will probably be a high spending phase. So right. so what is it? absolutely you're right about things like cash flow advice. It might be things like lifestyle advice or, the, yeah. or health advice. It might be a whole raft of things that are needed in this relationship model that had previously existed. I think we're going to see a lot more of it in our society as well, uh, Peter. Um, I was just uh, driving around the car yesterday and I heard uh, an advertisement for financial advice and reverse mortgages, um, a, a lady who wanted to buy a car on a commercial radio station. And I thought to myself, wow, like there, there are signs that this is going to become very prevalent. It'll be in social media. It'll be on our TV screens. It'll be on our radio. Um, financial advice will, 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 will be um, a lot more obvious. It'll be a lot more in your face, I think, in the next few years. And I think the you know those four choices you outlined are interesting when you look at the, the customer here because what the financial – and I'm going to go broader than advice here, financial services. The way they've looked or talked about or even represented retirees, in, even in their marketing, often doesn't isn't synergistic with how they feel about themselves. Like most people I know in the retirement phase don't feel like the grey nomad. They don't, that doesn't represent them. They don't feel connected to that. And I think it's a good example of how we're going to have to get better at that connection. We're going to have to really understand these people, where they're at, what they want to do, what they're experiencing and what lifestyle they want to lead. And that's how we can better help. And that's how the businesses could do better. You know, like I think there's, we can't just put them in these four boxes like we have historically. You know, I think what's, what comes out of a lot of these mega trends is, is that narrowing down of who you serve will serve both the client and the business. Oh, look, you're absolutely right. That that's, that's why the mega trend is there in a different way around skyrocketing retirement demand because it's about – first. the first question is, well, who is going to retire? I have no expectation of retiring. Yeah. Um, I might have a different type of lifestyle. Right. I'd love to. I'd love to know that I could safely do that. But I just, I'm built to work. You know, the, the way we engage with our world these days is so much yeah. more complex and different than working for a period of time and putting your feet up and driving a caravan into a tree. Yeah. But um, it's not the it's not the way we think about life anymore. So the question of who even cho- what does retirement look like? Then you have different types of advice panels about how you might yes. experience it. Because it's not a date anymore. No. I think we need to get past that. Pension may well be. Right. It just doesn't work that way. And I'm curious too about the financial services industry impact here. I mean, when you talk about those numbers of proportion in retirement versus working, um, you know, if you've got a book of a of an allocated pension base that's actually been drawn on versus super contributions going, like that's a significant difference for say super platforms. Like to be seeing a change in the volume in versus out over time, that's going to potentially require some well, change and, on that. To, John, to John's point earlier, there's a this has radical challenge for the product environment and the policy environment because government has not grappled with this. Well. No. And so the way it permissions or authorizes different types of product development, the way the super industry responds to these types of things, these things are still being tentatively stepped into. Yeah. When the wave is here, yes. Um, the change is now. We, we're waiting for these new models is really quite challenging. So I do think there's a that's going to face into advisors. The choices they have about what that retirement phase product model looks like yeah. is also going to change. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and without wanting to be um, uh, negative about. Uh, of what the implications might be um, as we move into the phase where people are drawing down um, funds from superannuation, it will lead to a change in superannuation fund investment strategy. Yeah. And that will have to mean a shift towards more conservative strategies so that they have money to pay each year. And um, 
our superannuation system is is mature now. It's it's matured um, particularly since since 1991 over the last um, few decades. But during that period, we've had to, we've been able to we've had the luxury of being able to invest a lot in equity, take yeah. a lot of risk, and make a lot of money. But whether those returns are going to be sustained when people become more risk averse and 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 they have a different yeah, and and also the credit questions, liquidity, the hundred percent has to be liquid. What a lot super of super all that during COVID, right? When people yeah. were were pulling That's out right. their their 10k or whatever they could get. Then yeah. you know liquidity will be so. Re- if returns are lower, then that's going to change the nature of financial advice too, because people may have fewer choices. Um, that's not to be too neat. I mean, there'll be still there'll be plenty of wealth around yeah. for, for people to access, but yeah, no, the return profile will change. Yeah, definitely. Which leads us naturally to the next disruptor, which is the intergenerational wealth transfer, which has become a big tagline that we're used to seeing uh, a lot of. You know, um, Dean, in the report, you've called this the grey tidal wave. What are the possible areas of impact here. How significant is this, not just, I guess, for the consumers in the Australian public, but for advisors? You know, how big is this wave? Well, one of the things that I thought about as we were working through this report is that I almost wanted to call that the intergenerational wealth model. Because it's right. look, a transfer implies that the money will just happily smoothly transfer <laughs> from one generation to the next. Right. What we know is I think it's going to be pitched battles around kitchen tables. Yeah. Um, and not because there's an inherent conflict there. But because there are different there, there can be there can be inherent and, and there can be in, inherent and there can be. I mean, will financial advisors, Dean, need to add um uh to their toolkit absolutely analyzing um uh, financial abuse uh, yep. within within I, within elder abuse yeah, we're seeing this. And, and, and and have to look at because th- th- that three point five trillion dollars in, in assets that'll be handed over the next few decades, it ain't gonna happen easily. No, that's right. I, I, I agree that it's there's gonna be challenges. We are seeing that already show up in some of the conversations. Okay. Elder abuse and financial concerns within family are, are a significant risk. Asset speaks to that quite frequently. Yeah. Um, we see cases of that beginning to move through the courts now. But um, these are things to be mindful of. But even at the even in the benign example mm. of a of a of a family who are having good conversations. Right. I mean, if I th- I'm, not <laughs> implying, I'm not implying my family is having good conversations, but even in my small micro anecdotal example, my daughter is 21 years of age. Um, she has a very different view about what the future of investments would look like and how she wants to be in charge of them. She has one of those micro investing apps that she plays with and yeah. gets into. Um, when I try to talk to her about long term planning, she throws things at me um, in a loving, gentle, significant <laughs> way. Um, she's also making, frankly, a lot better returns than I am <laughs> in the context of those investment decisions. So, but also part of the family dynamic about so home ownership doesn't sit there anymore. It's not likely to. They're making noise about never leaving home. Um, these are the sorts of conversations we end up in. So, what does that mean? What does it mean in terms of the sort of decisions I might take about what we even talked about before in terms of retirement? So, yeah, there's of course increasingly complex family structures in terms of who is in this wealth transfer and who isn't in the wealth transfer. How do we protect our assets in different family models? It's just in, that's why I'm in, in intergenerational wealth model. Yeah. Um, but to John's point, I know financial advisors have always felt that responsibility mm-hmm. to care for families, not just individual clients. But when every one of those family members has very different expectations, and in the case of the elder generation, potentially long-term care needs that, that need to be deeply considered and factored into, this puts the position of advisor into a very complex role. And it might be about um, psychological support systems, it might be about health advice, it might be a a practice that is multifaceted rather than simply yeah. straight down the line wealth spending or cash flow management. Yeah. These are all on the table. Yeah. And, and that's why I think it's – I see the future of financial advice for many of these folk being all those types of choices. What's the practice I want to run? Yeah. You know, is it deeply customer-centric? Is it deeply tailored? In which case, I want to be able to partner with a whole range of service providers that don't currently sit standard in a standard way within financial advice. Yes. I'm excited by that, I've got to admit, but I yeah. appreciate that for some it might be – at, at the IRS CEO's um, um, request, we went and investigated um, uh, research about the impacts on financial advisors during intergenerational wealth transfer um, if the, the head of the family was to pass away. And right. we found that it was incredibly high. That is the number of families who then say, um, oh, well, we're changing financial advisors. I think it was 70% of the time was the statistics. So it goes to Dean's point that um, uh, financial advisors, if they are, if they have the, the interests of the family um, at heart, are they going to be shifted on at the time when, as a result of conflict, or will they be the trusted source of advice? And that's a real challenge for the sector. And I think 
that's a perfect example of a real choice. Like you could make the choice that you're okay with that. You could actually say, you know what, I'm, I've got this sweet spot and naturally the, when it goes to the kids, they, they'll go on to an advisor that suits them. But once again, it's a choice, like choose to do this, make it part of the service. I mean, something that I think is going to come up a lot is facilitation skills, being able to be part of a conversation and help draw out the very conversations that don't happen between families that should happen earlier so that we're aware of what mum and dad want. We're aware of their needs. Now, a lot of this stuff, people think, you know, will, power of attorney, we've got it sorted. That's actually not the conversation that needs to happen. There's so much more to it returns, all sorts of things, the way they want to handle the money, all of this needs to happen much earlier and often doesn't at all. So, you know, that skill of being able to draw people out and help them have do that in a safe space, it's quite a different skill. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that the depth of client relationship was a metric of success rather than funds under management. Mm. Just as an example of that clear distinction, because you may have a deep, long and abiding relationship with clients that puts you in a very trusted role yeah. across multiple elements of the portfolio rather than just the funds. That's, these are the choices that yeah. advisors can make for because we're not saying you should do that and not be paid for it. No. Our strong advice and the, what, what emerged in the report was, no, this is these are chargeable services. What we what advisors will be able to charge for in the future may well be very different to what they've been charging for up to now. These first two um, mega trends that we've gone through, Peter, are both examples where the, the, the option for financial advisors could very well be about deepening their financial, um, their, their deepening their relationships with uh, their clients, um, having a higher level of personalization, um, uh, and also having higher fee opportunity. And it just it goes against, I think, what some of the conventional wisdom in the sector at the moment that um, it's all about breadth, it's all about scalability, and it's all about addressing you know the wider market. Um, that have lower capacity to pay. So we hope that the the big shift, the report, has a good balance there, that it's not just about um, let's use robo-advice, let's use technology, um, and let's get as many people through the door, that there actually are some trends where if financial advisors make this choice, they can actually just, you know, focusing on servicing, perhaps it's even a smaller number of clients, but in deep and more complex ways. And it's interesting. I mean, the the intergenerational wealth transfer to me is one of the ones that's across the board because they'll either be receiving or or giving, like, yeah, like they're different, really going to be different impacted, points right? in that value chain somewhere. That's yeah, right. exactly right. Whereas the next one we'll dive into, I think, you know, we can't forget the younger generation. Mm. Um, and you've got the mega trend, the new Australian dream. I mean, Dean, are you going to break our hearts and say that the white picket fence for Australians is not going to be the way forward? <laughs> I think we've all got a bit of that sense, <laughs> I, I, right? I think most people's hearts are already broken. Yeah, <laughs> that right. particular point, in the Peter. But, um, this was one was important for us to wrestle with because. That sort of traditional model of buy a house, sit on the asset, watch it grow as a central feature. Now, I was saying this, by the way, where that's still a a prevalent option for those people who are in that space. But what we're we're beginning to see is data that tells a whole different story. Now, we know this in the media. You just simply open up any any, any media. 54% of 45 to 54-year-olds won't own a house right. by 2036. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. It's just yeah. stupefying. That's right. That's that's sort of number two. That's you. the majority of middle-aged folks not having a house That's right. the projection. That's right. Yeah. that's right. So so the question becomes for advisors is so what if that was the – I don't want to use the word lazy, but there's a certain element of laziness about that model of asset advice. What's the alternative? Yeah. Because that for, for, for a vast bulk of present Australians of a reasonable age, I say reasonable as in let's call them post-45s, mm-hmm. That we have benefited from that particular model of asset accumulation. Yeah. Um, so the same scale of opportunity, the same scale of asset growth is simply not available to people under that age. So to John's point, those people who don't own, their, own those homes or even potentially participate in mortgages. Not without much higher risk or with less favorable tax treatment. And, and, this, yes. and this goes to the fact that for many people, I think they are looking at alternatives. You know, yeah. what, what are the other options? To achieve the same type of growth, recognizing by the way, housing is not just an investment consideration; it's a place to live, yes. <laughs> it's a place to build families, it's yeah. a place yes. that anchors you um, into communities. That's a deeply emotional and and significant thing. So, what does that change in the psychology of the advice model of the yes. client model? What's it change in the psychology of families when these things change? So, these are profound things mm. as an as a, an investment consideration. We are already beginning to see advisors make different offer different options to their clients about how they might grow those things, or spreading portfolios across different ways. I've certainly got friends of mine who every year argue the unwisdom of their strategy of saying we didn't do the housing thing, 
we did the self made super thing instead of saying good luck to you, fantastic. That was that was that was, that was healthy. Um, while meanwhile watching that they have struggled ever since because of the rent costs and the changing costs. But there was yeah. a decision they took. Yeah, what's that decision look like for the next? Group when you, it's not a choice, it's just a given. That's right. Yeah, and right. So how do advisors play into that? Um, and then this goes to even changes in products. It goes to changes in the financial services sector at large. Yeah, because mortgages shift. Um, the, the concept of residential home ownership will change. Well, aged care. I mean, there's aged a default care. funding of aged care, which is the house. That's right. Sell it. That's right. You know? I mean, if that isn't an option, that's right. That's a lump of money. Well, and it's going to come up to with. really bring that home to the advice community, the, the, the listeners to your podcast, is that that may have been exactly the plan. It's a reasonably straightforward plan: buy that home, stay in that home, sell that home, and move to retirement care. Mm. What if what when that step one is no longer available? Right. <laughs> How does that change the entire future planning dynamic for that particular client? A hundred percent. You know, it's a, it's, it's, a, and I, as I was going through the report, this is one of those ones that does break the brain a little because it's such a fundamental core part of how every young Australian, when we all started out, the, one of the first things you do, save for a deposit on a house. Like it feels like you're being an adult, you know, <laughs> and saving for a deposit. If that's not something they can do, how much will confidence shift? How much will insecurity in themselves? Shift? I know you're right. I, I think I think we might even see conflict arise from it. I mean, yeah. we're beginning to those stories already emerge in the fact that those um, older parents who hold their houses or are in their houses um, and for which the children can't benefit because they won't sell them, we are seeing family disruptions. We are seeing we're seeing all sorts of violence and things occur in those sorts of dynamics as people yeah. want to hasten their access to that property or to that yeah. wealth. Yeah, <laughs> but I, I, th- these are really quite. Radical shifts in our social fabric. Yes. As much as they are in the investment advice choices that different clients will make. Yes. You know, and I think as advisors, one of the things we're tasked with is preparing our clients for the possibilities in the future. I don't think we can determine them. Nobody can, but preparing them well. And this is one of those ones that we're going to have to get creative. You know, this is going to require some some more thinking. Now, I think the upside for the younger generation, though, is that they're better placed to cope with the next mega trend being the digital delivery of everything. They're not going to blink at the fact that it should all mm. be digital. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk historically. I'm one of those people as a previous host of the tech a podcast for the Advice Tech Podcast for Ensemble. A lot of talk, talk about tech stacks and automation and efficiency. Is the report identifying more than that? Like there's more than just this internal look. There's this shift for society going forward that's going to mean that there's more to this digital need for what we need from advice practices? Well, we think there is. We, we think that what's being talked about typically in the world of tech is efficiency. Yeah. Is that, is that industry has always sought opportunities to improve its service delivery, deliver it more cheaply, yeah. deliver it in a, in a way that sort of satisfies the business. This is a mega trend. This is about what's happening outside, about what the changing nature of client use is. Yeah. So you're right that the whole the whole generation of people will be saying, "No, I want my service delivered to me in a particular way." Yeah. And I think the advice industry is well behind on that particular yes. journey. Um, they think service gets done in particular ways, um, and clients will like that or won't work with me. Well, in the future, they may not work with you. Yeah. <laughs> and they're a growing population. Because it's too hard. That's right. The friction, you know, massive right. levels of friction. That's right. And then there will absolutely be um, fintech providers who step right into the middle of that conversation and say, have we got an answer for you? Yeah. We're dealing with a, a, a generation that's coming through, Peter, that are just digital natives or familiar with the internet. Um, but in a couple of years, um, folks who will be as familiar with using a generative AI tool as with using a search engine. So there's a lot of change coming and they're going to have different um, expectations of dealing with their with their financial um, advisors. So yeah, we do think that's going to be um, a, a really big change. A lot of financial advisors recognize it and they're up for the change, mm. um, Peter. I mean, of the folks that we spoke to, it's almost 70% who say, if I don't adopt new digital tools, I won't even remain as profitable as I am today, yeah. let alone uh, grow my business um, uh, over time. So, yeah, we do think that there's going to be a very, yeah, a, a really big change in um, what's offered. Uh, we name financial advice as being one of the top five industries to be disrupted by technology in the next uh, in the next five years. Um, uh, but yes, the use of uh, robot advice just as, as 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 one part of the technology toolkit, its use um, hasn't been particularly high at the moment. It's just over ten percent 
um, that there's some automating process for, for, for providing at least some draft recommendations by financial advisors. Just two thirds of financial advisors um, offer video consultations at the moment. I mean, I find that number, you know, perhaps a little bit low. Yeah. Um, it's not to say that you know, face-to-face isn't um, isn't valuable uh, some of the time, but you'd think that most advisors would would at least some of the time be be be, be using technology at least to communicate with, yeah. with with their clients too. So within there's there's quite a change that's got to happen there. I think what's interesting to me with, and I'm just going to use the broad word AI, but generative AI, and what and where things have been going is. Advice has always been presented as such a linear exercise, step one, step two, step three. And it's very clear what those steps are. In fact, you could almost argue they feel a bit legislated. Like it's it's sort of really been laid out for us. Things like generative, generative AI and what the public expect in terms of interaction mean things aren't linear anymore. We're going to need to be willing to sort of almost go a bit more 3D in the way that we can react to their needs. Some of them are going to start closer to the end. Like I just think we well, can't view will, this linear. The, the client will, process. the client will uh, will arrive at a meeting, um, possibly having done all those steps themselves. I mean, right. it won't be that that dissimilar to showing up at the GP's office and you've already checked, you've already Google doctored <laughs> what you think's wrong with you and what should be next and you're testing the yeah. the doctor against that or you jump into the taxi, you've already Google mapped it and you know the fastest way to go. Right. The same thing will happen here with financial advice clients. They'll show up and they'll have already, um, I mean, this is a, obviously has already happened. This already happens, you know, with people right. reading financial press or other things, but it's going to be like that on steroids, Peter. Yeah. I, I can already hear your listeners though, responding to the fact, and you, you touched on it there, Peter, that advice is in fact regulated. Mm. Um, and so you're right that one of the great errors of law um, in financial services is the process regulation of advice. Yeah. So I recognize that tension for advisors. And under the regulated advice space, they have to do certain things, which automatically, they, they can be improved radically mm. and, and are being improved arguably, um, at least in the regulatory space. But that's but to John's point, the customers don't care about that. No. <laughs> the client doesn't come in saying, "Gee, I really want to be a participant in your regular process." Um, they've got their ideas, they've done their research. So the question will be, how does the industry respond to that? How do the professional advisors shift and shape their practice? But also, how does the law keep up with them? Yeah, and I want to be really clear about that. That there is a challenge here in the way the law works. Yeah. Um. And and I recognise that tension for the sector. Um. But it's important to know that. We're talking here about the fact that these are demands that the market needs. The government also has to try and solve because arguably the QAR was spoke to the increasing need for advice. Yeah. The extraordinary gap for advice is what the Productivity Commission speaks to. Yeah. And you've got the Productivity Commission saying there's a huge need for financial advice yeah. and there's an insufficient number. There's a whole new conversation to be had with government yeah. about how the laws need to change. And I think that's where the... The choices you're outlining here are really important because what comes out of this to me is the process we'd used before was defined by legislation. I think going forward, we'll need to really understand our target customer and design a framework that works for them that we just know legislation will be met, you know, that will meet that need. But the, the framework is designed for the target consumer, you know, and that doesn't need to be the same steps. It does in the same order or any of those things. It's it's for them. It's their experience. You mean, you mean the it's, law... And the business designed for the benefit of the consumer. What a radical concept. I mean, it's not a good <laughs> But it is, it is a bit of a shift for the whole industry. Yes. Financial services, as we can all talk about a consumer focus, but it's not necessarily how things have been built or designed no, right. from a creative perspective. So it is a, it is a change. Now, this next disruption, um, was one of the ones that came up and was very popular on the Ensemble PD Day, uh, which is the you know natural disasters and environmental volatility. And this is one of those things that we've almost become a bit uh, numb to. Well, yes, you know the environment. Oh dear, you know, like we've all become used to that. But I'm just not sure that to date anybody's talked about what that means for advice. Like it actually will mean going forward and what it means for consumers in the way that they're going to live. Like that's some pretty serious consideration. Mm. Look, it, it really is such an important area of thinking because it, it didn't it didn't surprise us, but it really was what, a, a perfect example of a mega trend. Yeah. Something that's so profoundly obvious and yeah. significant in the wider environment. You only have to spend a couple of seconds before, actually, this will have an effect on advice. Right. But the whole no changing model of assets, what assets look like. 
again, back to that housing example or physical built environment, how that's affected by climate change. Yeah. Um, even just the nature of investing, the way investing works, the way large scale, even super funds that John spoke to earlier in terms of what they invest in, the structural components of what we think assets are. But then on top of that, you think about the fact that for every consumer, 80, what we found is 80% of the consumers have had an experience with climate change, financial impact of the climate change. Right. This can be through insurance effect. It can be through asset loss in their own life. It can simply be their own lifestyle effects. Yeah. Things, we all travel. We all move around. We all have places and, 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 and are familiar with what it means to be subject to climate change. So it's no surprise at all that that immediately bites in yep. financial advice. I'm not just talking about risk products in terms of general insurance products or even life insurance products. We're talking here about standardized assets. We're talking about the way people live. Yeah. The, the different decisions they make about where they work. Yeah. Um, how they work, all of these are factors relevant to a financial advice conversation and they're all in everybody's life right now. We've just not seen them before in no. the context of advice, but they are right in the middle of the conversation, one of those things we just were looking around and didn't see. Yeah, you know, and it, and as, as I thought it through, if more homes, as an example, are at risk of, they can be small events or they can be large-scale flooding, fires, like wipeout events. If more of that's happening, general insurers are going to start to insure less of them Right or proportionate less of the damage, there'll, there'll, there'll be a change there. Now, the knock-on effect from that is lenders are going to freak out about lending high levels of lending on those homes because there isn't just a check that somebody's going to write to replace the whole thing that could drop. So does that mean in the future, we were already talking about you know the new Australian dream and how it's going to be tough potentially to buy. If the deposit changes from 10 or 20% to 50% because you can't get general insurance on the whole lot, so the lender doesn't want to lend you the whole lot, that's significant too. Like it's almost it's almost accelerating the other mega trend. You know, it's it's making that even bigger. So, you know, I can see that that will be a massive shift mentally for clients and heads for advisors. Oh, and it, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right that this is a wide scale effect for the whole sector of financial services and for government in the future of concepts of risk. I mean, we do expect them, all financial institutions will shortly be, have to be reporting against the nature-based financial disclosure obligations making different risk calculations about the way they lend and right. on what they lend, and in some cases cannot lend at all in the context of flood-prone property areas. Yeah. So these sorts of decisions that people once had choice over will find they don't have those choices. So there are, there are radical changes in the context of what we see as an investable asset, again, from a home through something more large scale. But at a real consumer level, mm. it begins to affect what they can buy, what they can afford. Um, I wouldn't be at all surprised if... If, if the lending criteria gets tougher um, in these types of spaces, for especially for climate risk affected areas. Yeah. We're already seeing large scale reinsurers globally simply say Australia is an uninsurable country. Yeah. Um, so when you've got the global reinsurers. That. Is that? I mean, that the that's... reinsurers are where the decisions start. That's where it all that's starts, right. right? And and yeah, I can see, I, I mean, even just for retirement advice, you know, if people decide to see change or tree change, Potentially, advisors are going to have to be far more aware of those environmental risks to say to the client, can you just check, <laughs> please, mm. are you going into a fire-prone or an area because we're going to need to apply some some other risk mitigation strategies to cope with that? Because well, it if is- it's not flood-prone or, or at risk of of, um, of uh, erosion um, mm-hmm. by the coastline, it probably will be fire. Um, it probably will be fire. Right. Fire-prone. It's not a one or the other. It's going to be mo- mo- most folks. And yeah. yeah, this will be something that financial advisors um, who, who are listening to the podcast will be aware of, particularly if they're in regional and in rural areas. I mean, this conversation about natural disasters and its impacts on assets, I mean, that's had a long history in Australia. Yeah. And it's just, it's being taken to the next being taken to the next level. And even if clients aren't raising it directly, something financial advisors um, will have to be alive to. But you would be surprised, Peter, that when we spoke to financial advisors, there was a, I think, Dean, a surprisingly high level of interest in tackling this issue, in learning more about it. It's actually three quarters of the existing financial advisor community who say, this is going to be a really big trend in the next few years that I need to get across and make sure it's part of my, my, um, my product suite. Oh, and if we can help more, then that's fantastic. I think that's good for the industry. You know, it's broadening how we can help. So continuing with the environmental theme, you know, but focusing on ethical investments, then the next trend you've outlined is sort of riding this green wave of future investing. Do you see that going further than it already has? Like, is there more in this than what we were already seeing in terms of fund options and the way that the consumer is choosing to invest, say, their super? I think the difference we saw in this mega trend, Peter, was that 
the, the pattern so far has been led by investment houses largely wanting to offer right. ESG linked investments and yeah. frankly corporate obligations and reporting obligations has yeah. meant that, that they do have to find a way to offer investments and look like they're ethical. Yeah. The difference we saw is that consumers are beginning to ask different questions. So the early adopters of ESG investing and you know what we all know is that clients will always prefer returns over ethics right. for, at, when they reach a particular need in their life, financial need in their life. But the changing demographic model here is that younger people in different sorts of communities of cohort are asking themselves different questions about that future. Yep. Unsurprisingly, they want the planet to be here. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's not unreasonable, I think. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> and so they are beginning to make different lifestyle choices yes. as well as that flows through to different investment choices. So where before I think it was a discretionary choice, something that people would like to do and if they to had sufficient capacity yeah. did do. It shifts from a discretionary construct to a purposive one, yeah. and that's the shift we're seeing in that mega trend. And that's a that's a demographic wave. So it is that's why it's a wave. It's something that's coming very hard um, for that younger generation of people making different choices in time. If I can't have a house, right? And and, I, and and frankly, the whole thing's on fire. So my risk my risk metrics are changed. I want you to invest in good things. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I don't want to be putting fuel on the fire. That's right. Yeah. I'd like to try and temper that a little. But there, there could also be help on the way for this one, uh, Peter and Dean, which is more technology tools and particularly generative AI tools that'll help financial advisors navigate right. the landscape of investment opportunities because yeah. it's it been won't, clunky for a while. It's been clunky, yeah. and uh, yeah, and 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 more information will help financial advisors um, because the landscape will get more complex. It won't just be about who signed up to net zero or not investing in in certain industries that are harmful to the environment, but it's a broader range of social and governance issues as yes. well that will now be part of it about, you know, what are the uh, international relations like? And as soon as there's, you know, a conflict around the world, well, that can affect people's um, values, choices, and outlook on some of these things as well. So uh, the landscape will change quickly, but maybe there'll be some technology solutions that financial advisors can 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 make themselves au fait with. And we're certainly seeing part of this already with the way um, shareholders are being asked, or the big shareholders being asked to represent the smaller shareholders with some decisions that have happened with large corporates, saying this behaviour isn't good enough. Like there's been some some more proactive action taken from that from the investor's perspective. Whereas I guess previously the choice was down to, well, do you invest with them or not? Now there's almost some some more proactive behaviour. So I think we'll see more of that as well. And advisors are going to have to be able to have that conversation with their clients um, and you know help them understand their options. Now, for the last of our disruptors, and thank you for sticking with us, folks, we're on number seven, um, something I'm sure many a compliance manager has cringed at trying to work out how to fold this in or how to help advice practices deal with it, is digital assets and product proliferation. Now, this isn't just cryptocurrency, Dean, is it? There's more to it than that, but I guess it encompasses that. What are we facing on this front? Into the yeah, look, it's it's definitely bigger than crypto. Yeah. And in fact, it leans a little bit on from John's conversation there in that it's about the fact that, frankly, assets are borderless now. Yeah. Um, not only are they borderless, they're virtual. <laughs> so we're seeing a radical shift in the way these things work. Historically, as we all know, Australia typically structured itself in the context of investments within country. Yep. Unless you're participating in obviously overseas ETFs and things and other sorts of investment models. We're now seeing the fact that you can be investing quite directly overseas. You can be investing in different markets in different ways. Um, so the borderless nature means that almost all things are virtual. Right. Almost all you are only ever seeing a digital representation mm-hmm. of an investment. Bond, my bond on That's right. Paper, I like <laughs> Unless you sit camp up on that investment strategy in PNG, you probably are yes. probably only seeing it digitally. Yeah. Um so Digital and cryptocurrency are an example of that. Yeah. But they're just an extreme example of what is already borderless investment. Yeah. Once used to be bricks and mortar style things, things that could be seen or touched or felt, those things are shifting. So how do we capture that? How do you, and to John's point, how do you make good decisions as an advisor Mm. about what's real or not, what's true or not? So this is an increasing call for expertise, an increasing call for the fact that different partnerships or different experts might be needed to navigate to what these things are. But for even jurisdictionally at a legal framework, we are seeing, yeah, as we all know, the sort of ETF models for crypto are beginning to emerge. They're available right now. You can participate in them. That's not mad, by the way. I'd you know, <laughs> take your advice from professionals, um, the members of this particular podcast. But it's just a reflection of yeah. the fact that these things are real and they are present. And the, a different generation of consumer 
is completely comfortable with them That's in right. in, way, in ways that others aren't. D- D- Dean Sanders, fifty four percent of millennials um, have owned some type of cryptocurrency or or do now. So this is like the digital native conversation. This isn't you know some strange asset that doesn't really mean anything. Um, and there's likely to be more than just a financial driver here. That is, there is an element of identity that's yes. part of being. That's part of being, you know, within the crypto community. Um, it's a, a lifestyle. It's a hobby thing as well. And uh, there's a tricky, tricky, tricky set of issues for financial advisors to navigate here because they can win more customers by learning more about this area and appealing to what their clients are interested in. But at the same time, the regulator's advice is don't invest more in cryptocurrencies then you are prepared to lose, which is basically the same type of advice that you'd, you'd, you'd give a gambler, you know, <laughs> who, was, who, was, who was walking to the casino. So, um, uh, yeah, the, the, the advisor community has a really kind of tricky set of issues to navigate on that one. And I do think it's going to require a bit more, so, so better communication, for example, of why banking and the infrastructure exists and why it produces confidence and why money and the value of it is underpinned, like it underpins that confidence. Like there's a whole lot of layers there that the consumer wouldn't be aware of that we all rely on and and actually get a whole lot of, you know, what makes it easier, for example, for Australia to survive some of the history you've seen other things has been the way our banking works. When things are sitting outside of that, that's not a problem. But then we need to understand the risks of that so that the consumer can understand. So they're well, making and, conscious choices. And I think I think understand the risks in a way that doesn't further alienate people. Correct, doesn't because demean. I, I think that's wrong. You know, we to, can't demean with this. To John's point, um, people are often focused on those types of assets because they are reacting sure. um, to a system they don't think has worked for them. Yes. This present system is excluding a whole raft of people. Yeah. So how is it that? Well, why would I want to participate in that sort of model? So that, that identity question that John raises is really important. It is. I mean, I remember famously in my own life, and this, this is a bad anecdote to perhaps conclude on, but but my, my one example of running into a, a, a definite um, crypto evangelist was a tiler that was tiling my bathroom, and I came home to find him naked in the bathroom, tiling the floor, then giving me an ex- a, a loud lesson on cryptocurrencies uh, so in my head, those two things are related. <laughs> I, don't, I, I, can, I can stay away for a good reason. But I think it is important. It's um, I would argue the financial services industry is already at arm's length from the Australian public. I don't think this is a close relationship. We can't argue it is. The more we are dismissive of their reaction to things like digital assets, the the more distant they'll become. So I completely agree with you. We need to embrace this as a choice that people are making, Okay. So how can we help them understand that choice and understand the impact of it? You know, where does it fit? And that might be a perfect way to round to, to round out. They must step. They must step into this into some of these conversations, Peter, because the alternative um, could be disaster for Australia between um, the types of informal advice that people might get on um, uh, social media from from influencers, you know, right through to to outright uh, scams right. um, and illegal behaviour that. Um, if financial advisors aren't there part of the conversation and if, if the regulations don't facilitate, you know, regulated advice, uh, trusted advice being provided to clients, well, the alternative really, really could be, could, could be, could be much worse, Dan. Uh, look, and this, is a, this might be a clunky way to sort of round that up, but I think that's, that's exactly what we thought about through this report was that even you, you, you put the challenge earlier, Peter, about how many trends did you start with to end yeah. up at seven? Well, in fact, we could probably roll them into one. And that is the substantial shifts in the social systems around us and the familiar models of the way people are engaging with advice. Yeah. So all of those are about individuals and or um, retirees or aging people with wealth in different sorts of scenarios. They're about changes in people. Yeah. And, and what those changes in people will demand of the advice sector and how ready are they for it. So it is. It goes. All the, I know client segmentation might sound like a very bad way to finish that, but it is that example of understanding who our clients are. Mm. What do they need from us as a sector? Precisely how how complex does our business need to be to fit and moderate and adjust to the different demands we have to bring more people into yeah. a strong financial future? Yeah. To bring more Australians into safety around that financial future. Yeah. That's what this is actually about, and we're just seeing those trends that are driving that particular market because we want advisors to capture it. We want advisors to assist more Australians into that stronger financial future. 
Yeah. Dean Sanders, we're going to need more financial advisors mm. in this country. Peter, you know what we won't need? We won't need less. And one of the <laughs> one of the alarming statistics in the in the big shift in this Iris Deloitte Access Economics report is twenty one percent of financial advisors thinking about retirement or potential career change inside the financial services industry. We hope there's enough um, uh, 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 positive uh, news in this story about the outlook, about where customers are going, and enough information about the choice that advisors can make to succeed that will make folks who listen to this podcast want to stick at it, take the next step, um, not just help their clients, but but help the country because you know, without them providing this service, if we had 20% fewer advisors, I mean, that would be obviously terrible um, for Australia. So we hope this has got this this report available online, hopefully provides folks with the, the information that they need to embrace that change and take the next step. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's exciting to me about this is it's it's chock full of opportunity. This isn't something that's going to hit us over the head in terms of um, reeling us back from a business perspective. This is just, well, where do you want to play? Like, it's, understand what's coming. Where do you want to play? And deeply understand the consumer, um, which I think is fabulous. So, John, what's the action you want people to take? What, you know, lighting a fire. What's the action you'd like them to take listening to the from listening to the podcast? Oh, look, I think the best thing would be to. Uh, talk to some of your colleagues um, inside the community about uh, inside the financial advisor community about what changes they're experiencing. Right. Um, talk to your staff members around the office um, about some of these ideas about changing nature of uh, consumers, um, how the business can change, so that you can that you can do it together. So I think that that's something that that uh, hopefully would be a benefit to the advisor community. This feels big, but actually it's going to be quite granular mm. in what we do. This is literally about the experience people are going to get. How about you, Dean? What do you see? I mean, for advice practices, but even broader industry participants, how do you want? How would you love to see people act um, after you all know, be inspired by the insights from the report? Look, I do think that. Um I know we've used the language of opportunity. I think there is opportunity here for advisors and the whole sector in a new relationship that we haven't always had before. Yeah. That that this is about better products. It's about better participants in the marketplace outside of advice. It's about all of them working together mm. because the client need is broad um, and it requires different models of partnership, different expertise at the table. I think that's really exciting. Yes. I, I don't think our regulatory system is close to understanding that and, and certainly won't be able to explain it or regulate for it. So it does fall to the industry to imagine different ways of working with clients. Imagine being a full service space. Yeah. We are engaging in health advice, retirement advice, lifestyle advice, you know, psychological advice, whatever whatever advice, children and caring, whatever models. I, I don't know. It's it's all up there. It's all yeah. out there as opportunities because if you own that relationship with clients as a trusted advisor, not everybody will be there. I appreciate that. That's the point. Yeah. This is choices. Yeah. Some advisors will say, look, I know what I'm good at and I can pick those particular investment strategies and make them work. Perfect. Yeah. There'll be whole markets available for that. Yes. There'll be others who are the quant experts that can 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 you know, do all sorts of magic with a spreadsheet. There'll be a whole world of opportunity for that space. It's about picking it and being ready to invest in yourself for that mm. and invest in your business for that. Now, the good news is, as we said at the top, that advice businesses are more robust and feeling more resilient. I know these sometimes these conversations feel like more work, <laughs> more challenge, but I, also, I do think it's about now bringing those muscles to the right fight, yeah, you know, to the right future rather than fighting the old battles a thousand different ways. Yeah, this is about a whole taking all of those things that have been learned and applying them in a whole new set of opportunities. Yeah, and and growing from there. This is not a defensive play here. This is offense. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now we've covered so much uh, in this episode, and there's still much, so much more in the report. There's a lot of detail in there. There's a lot of opportunity to dive deeper. So, listener, I would encourage you to head over to the Ensemble platform. There's an Iris space there. You can get access to the report if you haven't already got it and start those conversations. John's absolutely right. Uh, start talking about this. This is not – nobody has an answer. It's going to come out of debate, right? It's going to come out of us maybe disagreeing, two very different practices. You're going to learn more about what you want by having that conversation with another advisor. You know, and basically – what I'd love to see is all of us really riding these waves of change into the future, um, not drowning uh, in the process. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. I can't wait to see where this goes in the future. Thank you, Peter. 